Welcome to the American Planning Association podcast. This episode continues our series that looks at how different communities prepared for and responded to natural hazards such as floods, wildfires, hurricanes, and more. How have planners in these communities promoted resilience in their hazard mitigation to disaster recovery plan? We'll find out on this episode of Resilience Roundtable, brought to you in conjunction with the American Planning Association's Hazard Mitigation and Disaster Recovery Planning Division. I'm your host, Rich Roths. I'm a part-time senior hazard planner for Burton Planning Service of Columbus, Ohio. I'm also a proud member of the American Planning Association's Hazard Mitigation and Disaster Recovery Planning Division. Our guests today are Jack Heidi, AICP, CFM, and Emily Ussery, PhD. Jack is a community planner with FEMA Region 2, serving New Jersey, New York, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Emily is an epidemiologist with the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Jack and Emily, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you, Rich. We're glad to have you here. Uh, To get started, can you each describe your current positions? Sure, I can go first. So I am a lieutenant in the in the United States Public Health Service, assigned to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, here, I work as an epidemiologist in the Physical Activity and Health Branch, and we partner with national groups, with states, and local communities to um, really ensure that all Americans have opportunities to be physically active. One of our priorities right now is creating activity-friendly um, or walkable communities where people live, work, and play. And um, I'm also an officer in the public health service, and so in that role I can be deployed to respond to public health emergencies. I'm a community planner with FEMA Region 2 um, within the mitigation division out of New York City. Uh, I work with state, local tribal and territorial governments to provide uh, technical assistance, training, and plan review on hazard mitigation plans and the planning process within the region. Uh, you, can you tell us how you got into hazard mitigation and disaster recovery planning? Sure. So I am an epidemiologist by training, um, not a planner. Um, I have a Master of Public Health and a PhD in epidemiology from the University of Texas School of Public Health. Um, and I've been working at the CDC for the past three and a half years. We occasionally interact with urban and transportation planners in my field, um, but the, the U.S. Virgin Islands hurricane response was my first experience with hazard mitigation and disaster recovery planning. Um, and I was asked to participate in that response because of my background um, promoting physical activity and working with communities and specifically the Virgin Islands and Um, creating more walkable, activity-friendly communities. I got my first experience as a kid, actually, in Alaska following the Exxon Valdez oil spill, um, where I got to see firsthand the the effects of an oil spill on the fishing community, the economy, and the environment up there. And then later on, my first experience with a natural disaster, when I was in Afghanistan with the U.S. Army, uh, serving in uh, Pektika province as a civil affairs officer, there was a major flooding event that occurred. And so I, I got my first real taste of natural disasters and flooding there. Very interesting. Uh, something we usually don't see uh, from that angle. Can you both give us uh, an idea of your involvement in uh, the hurricanes in the U.S. Virgin Islands? Sure. So in 2016, about... Um, a year before Hurricanes Irma and Maria hit the Virgin Islands, um, I worked with the Virgin Islands Department of Health to conduct a walkability audit across uh, the three islands in the territory. And so at that time, the Department of Health actually asked CDC to come help them, work with them to collect data on built environment supports and barriers for physical activity. Um, This was a, a priority for the Department of Health then because There was a large prevalence of physical inactivity in the Virgin Islands, and chronic diseases they were seeing were fairly prevalent as well. Um, 
And so we know, you know, the ways in which communities are designed can promote regular physical activity and improve health. So through our walkability audit that we did in 2016, we found that um, features like sidewalks, street lighting, access to public transit, and walkable destinations near home were, were pretty uncommon across the territory. And so we used those data. Um, we worked with the Department of Health to identify some potential action steps that they could do to improve walkability across the territory. And then the data also helped the Department of Health kind of highlight some of these issues that they were seeing. Um, a few months before the hurricanes, the Department of Health and CDC convened a workshop with different um, agencies and, and community groups in the territory to really to raise awareness of how the built environment can influence health and then to develop action plans for building more walkable spaces um, across the territory. I would think that a lot of our listeners don't have an idea of how big the islands are, the topography there. Uh, could you go into that a little bit? Sure. So the Virgin Islands are comprised of three separate islands, um, St. Croix, St. John, and St. Thomas. Um, they're about, or before the hurricanes, there are about 100,000 residents, I believe, across the territory. St. Thomas is probably the most densely populated. Um, St. Croix is the biggest land area. Um, and then St. John is comprised mostly of national park. Um, but there are some residents also on St. John. St. Thomas is a fairly mountainous, and so is St. John. So there's a lot of steep slopes there and a lot of development on hillsides. St. Croix is a lot flatter, but there is um, some uh, steep slopes there as well. But it's a fairly, St. John and St. Thomas in particular, fairly mountainous uh, terrains. And when it comes to my background with uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands prior to the storms, it's not as not as grand as Emily's. I, I visited St. Croix actually three weeks before the hurricanes, and that was the first time I'd ever been to the territories. Um, we at FEMA conducts an annual mitigation consultation with all of their states, tribes, and territories. And so we were down there doing that three weeks before. Otherwise, I had very little knowledge or experience with the territory prior to these two storm events. But at least having been there earlier, you had a good picture of before and after then. Absolutely. Would both of you or one of you care to give us an overview of the disaster and their impacts on the communities there? So in the span of two weeks, in September of 2017, um, Hurricanes Irma and Maria hit the three U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, these are two Category 5 hurricanes back-to-back. Um, the, the storms destroyed the communication systems, the power grid. Um, they left, you know, thousands of residents without power, without communications, um, and all of the major hospitals and critical care centers um, suffered damage and were closed after the hurricanes. And so many patients had to be evacuated to the U.S. mainland to receive care. I believe about half of all housing was damaged, with low- to middle-income households um, especially affected. And the storms also had a, had a major impact on the local economy, which relies heavily on tourism. I would just add that the, the two storms, unlike a lot of the storms we saw in 2017 that people are familiar with, like Hurricane Harvey, or even 2018 with like Hurricane Florence, um, these two storms were really largely wind-driven with minimal flooding impacts on the islands. There was a lot more flooding impacts in Puerto Rico from these storms and Florida from Maria as well, but there was very minimal, and it just the storms resulted in uh, several billion dollars in damage, and I know that as an emergency management agency and as a country, we tend to get more focused on the flooding, and this just shows you how the hurricanes uh, can be solely like wind driven and do just as much damage, if not more, in some ways. Although, again, using Puerto Rico as an example, uh, except for right after the hurricanes, I don't uh, remember seeing a lot of uh, TV coverage of the Virgin Islands, but it sounds like the, a lot of the damage was similar to Puerto Rico, even though. Puerto Rico did have flood damage also. 
That's very true. The, there was a lot of similarities between the two. There's a lot of differences as well, but uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands kind of dropped out of the the media, if you will, uh, following Maria making impact on Puerto Rico. It sounds similar to uh, Hurricane Katrina. You heard a lot of about New Orleans and uh, not a whole lot about the uh, other communities, Mississippi and uh, Alabama and such. So can you go into what your roles were in the, during the recovery period and, and how the two of you worked together? Sure. So I deployed to the Virgin Islands for a month during um, February and March of um, this year. Um, to support, I was supporting the health and social services recovery support function. So I was on the health side, um, working as the environmental health coordinator. And since the Department of Health was focusing on improving um, community design and the built environment before the hurricanes, this became um, an area of focus during the recovery process as well. And so my role was really to convene um, our local partners there who had an interest in health and and the built environment. And then I worked with them to identify recovery projects and strategies for um, rebuilding the infrastructure that would um, also have long-term health benefits for residents. And so um, a lot of what my role was was talking to decision makers about how healthy community design principles Um, are related to hazard mitigation and disaster recovery, and then helping partners incorporate some of those principles into their long-term recovery plans. Um, I also helped to connect our local partners with the different federal agencies who are administering recovery funding, such as FEMA and the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, um, and then helping them understand what kind of projects might be eligible for the different federal programs. And so that's how I met Jack, who um, at the time was administering the, or helping with the hazard mitigation grant program. Um, And Jack was, or is a great advocate for really taking a a broader um, approach to hazard mitigation and and considering things like walkability and health as important components of of resilience in a community. Jack, could you go into... uh how you work together in your role during the recovery period? So I was deployed to the USVI uh, for nearly a year as the mitigation advisor to the Federal Disaster Recovery Coordinator. And for those listeners who don't know who that is, that is the FDRC, who is responsible for facilitating disaster recovery coordination and collaboration between federal and territorial governments, the private sector, and voluntary and faith-based and community organizations. Uh, The role involves bringing together a team of federal agencies, much like Emily and the CDC, to lead complex challenges of the disaster, uh, leveraging all the available federal resources to support the territory and its recovery efforts. And the FDRC leads the six recovery support functions, or RSFs as they're known, which include um, housing, infrastructure, economics, health and human services, natural and cultural resources, and community planning and capacity building. And each of those RSFs are led by various federal agencies. Um, as the mitigation advisor, I was charged with helping the FDRC and all the RSFs to understand the numerous FEMA hazard mitigation assistance programs, the NFIP, and other mitigation programs that would be uh, at the disposal of these federal agencies and the territory. And I also served as sort of the technical advisor for mitigation best practices. And so I spent a lot of time working across all the RSFs, um, trying to help them understand how we could help build back the community, you know, make USVI more resilient and, and working across all the sectors. Um, you know, we tend to get focused on a couple of sectors within uh, FEMA's response, even though a lot of federal agencies come to the table, you know, we're really good with working out like, with HUD and the Army Corps, and we have fantastic relationships with these groups, but some of the other federal agencies or sectors, uh, it's not that they're getting left behind, they're just, nobody's, a lot of people haven't taken the time to consider the, how all the sectors could be helping themselves towards mitigation and recovery. And so that's why I got linked up with like Emily to talk about walkability and healthy environments within the recovery and even within mitigation itself. So I spent a close to a year working across 
about 20 different federal agencies trying to help them understand mitigation and trying to understand their programs so that we could effectively work together and really make a more resilient community. Does the U.S. Virgin Islands have a strong planning background, you know, outside of the emergency uh, management department? They have uh, several types of plans in place. Um, they have like a waste management plan. They they have, I did a lot of research right after the storm, and I pulled up about 40 different types of plans. The level of their effectiveness or actual implementation is probably debatable. Uh, there's some really great plans, and there's some plans that they've created that um, they were done, and then they weren't implemented for possibly political reasons or technical feasibility or funding. Um, I think one of the more interesting things in USVI is they've actually had a law since the 70s that they have to have a comprehensive plan, land use plan, and they've completed one probably three or four times in their history, but they've never actually adopted one. So they've never had a land use plan. Interesting. And obviously that could really affect their recovery. Yes. And it is something we're working on with the territory right now, with a partnership between FEMA and the Army Corps, uh, working on getting them grant money to actually develop and implement a, a land use plan. I do have to say it's probably similar to what we see on the mainland, so uh, it couldn't criticize them over it because we see the same things here also. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We we see plans developed all the time by any number of jurisdictions in some of the most modern cities in the world that are never implemented for whatever reason. Right. Could you explain how the two of you actually work together? So the way we got connected is I was trying to make connections with the health and human services recovery support function um, through the, the lead of the – Emily wasn't the lead, but one of the people who came in to help support – and, uh, you know, we started talking about various efforts that were going on, and I was working with a colleague from the Community Planning Capacity Building, uh, FEMA side, who we were both talking about the idea of how could we get APA involved. And through that, we discovered that the USVI Walkability Institute, which Emily talked about she was a part of, um, was already doing work with APA And so we linked up with them and we started discussing what was possible within FEMA and, you know, the CDC and walkability and the stuff that was going on in the territory. And we started talking about various issues and we kind of landed on a particular project. Um, And we'll talk more about this a little later. Um, But so we started just talking to each other and seeing, talking about their program, talking about uh, FEMA programs and seeing that, you know, we could actually complement each other if we just started to work through some things. And so a lot of our work was just talking through the work that each of us do to make sure that there weren't, like, overlaps and and duplication of benefits, but that we could actually complement one another. And so we talk about walkability and these walkability and the the built environment working groups that uh, the HSS folks help set up. Yeah, when I arrived in the Virgin Islands, um, some of our local partners there were working on developing proposals for the hazard mitigation grant program that Jack was working on and administering and helping the, the territory sort of understand. And so I was working with some of our connections in the Department of Health and the Department of Public Works. They had some projects that they had um wanted to accomplish before the hurricanes that now seemed like they could be um, potential projects to to do in the recovery. So, for example, um, there was one area around a hospital um, that had experienced flooding and some of the streets were washed out around there, and so they needed to be rebuilt. Um, but they had already, before the, the hurricanes, had planned to put in a, a walking trail in this area. And so we talked to Jack to see if maybe we could kind of combine those needs and come up with one, one project where they could both implement some, some stormwater improvements in that area, but also build in some, some long-term improvements for the community that would add um, a walking path for people who worked at the, at the hospital and safer connections with the retail area that's across the street. 
um, adding transit in that area for all the people who use, um, who use that area surrounding the hospital. And so that's just an example of kind of some shared areas of interest that, w that we identified and how I um, work directly with Jack. Since you had mentioned the hospital, uh, was the hospital able to operate throughout the uh, hurricanes? So when I was there, the hospital um, was not operating. The, it um, sustained a lot of damage during the storm, um, and so it wasn't operating at full capacity. The hospitals uh, had a lot of roof damage, and when the hurricane rain came in, it ended up damaging a lot of the equipment a lot of the expensive medical equipment that was on the upper stories of the hospital. And this occurred on both the major hospitals in St. Thomas and St. Croix. Um, but there's a lot of money going into the territory right now. And I don't know, Emily, I don't know if you know, they, they keep going back and forth of how they're going to deal with the hospital situation. I know that they've debated completely replacing them. I know that they've debated uh, just retrofitting the hospital's that ex exists now. Um, I know that a solution is going to happen and it will get fixed to be ready for the next future storm events. But right now, I don't know that they've come to a, a conclusive decision of whether it's a complete replacement or just a retrofit. Something to follow in the future then. Did uh, the Virgin Islands have a recovery plan or an annex to the response plan? Um, the Virgin Islands uh, did not have its own response or recovery plan. However, uh, FEMA prior to Irma Maria had been working very closely with the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico for that matter on developing a response and recovery plan. So it was a, a FEMA uh, territory joint effort. So both the territory and FEMA were part of the plan. And it was being worked through when Irma hit uh, St. Thomas and St. John and brushed along Puerto Rico because it didn't make a direct hit on Puerto Rico. Um, but then when Maria came by 12 days later, the whole scenario and the devastation from the plan kind of threw the plan out the window, and they kind of had to wing it from there. Uh, not that they're not trained professionals, but the plan didn't account for two storm events in less than a two-week period. Kind of a double punch. Exactly. Um, uh, there were some other products, though. Uh, there was a product I have to mention that was actually done in 1989 after Hurricane Hugo, which I don't remember. I think it was like a Cat 3 that hit the U.S. Virgin Islands. But uh, the Building Science Division of FEMA out of headquarters actually came in and did a better homes guide, which was a technical guide detailing engineering and architectural details for building more resilient homes in the territory, uh, especially to hurricanes. And after Irma and Maria hit, uh, FEMA sent in a mitigation assessment team to actually see of the mitigation work that had been done in the territory, what held up, what didn't, what went well, what went bad. And it was actually shown that all the homes built using this better home guide, all of them survived with little to no damage, which is incredible to see, you know, a 1989 document. And I was actually at several... Uh, fairs and festivals that FEMA set up tables uh, in the territory during post-recovery, and there was actually people bringing up their 1989 copy of this manual saying, this saved, this saved my house. And FEMA actually, since then, actually went in and is doing an update of that plan. Great. It sounds similar to what we saw with uh, Hurricane Michael in the, uh, in the Florida panhandle with the houses that were designed to the design standards that are now in place in the Miami area, and you saw a house standing there and nothing around it because the surrounding houses had been destroyed. Exactly. And this, this update of the Better Homes Guide is actually another great example of the work uh, of collaboration we did with um, the Health and Human Services recovery support function because not only did the uh, building sciences team from FEMA come in, but we actually brought in the experts on healthy building materials for the built environment. And they, from um, HHS and the CDC, who helped incorporate healthy building materials that would help 
in mitigation and recovery. So not only do we have these more resilient structures just to uphold to a natural disaster, but now they're fill, they're going to be built with materials that can withstand the after effects of, you know, rainwater getting in and, and possible flooding and stuff like that. I know APA is encouraging communities to adopt recovery plans pre-disaster. And uh, it sounds like FEMA is doing the same thing as far as they can without requirements in the uh, published in the Federal Register. Yes. Did uh, the Virgin Islands have a uh, an approved mitigation plan? Yes, the U.S. Virgin Islands had a approved a mitigation plan from 2014, um, and they have a pretty solid history of of obtaining um, various forms of hazard mitigation assistance. Uh, mostly pre-disaster mitigation grants in support of their plan and good mitigation projects. Um, They've completed, pre-Irma Maria, they completed a lot of undergrounding of uh, electrical utilities, uh, wind retrofits of of critical infrastructure, and some home acquisition projects as well. And uh, many of the mitigation actions found in the 2014 plan are being pursued as grants uh, under the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program post-disaster. Great. So they're obviously able to use both pots of money to further hazard mitigation. Yes, they, they have a pretty solid background on it, and it's it's been good to see. And some of that stuff in the mitigation assessment team showed how the, the places where they did mitigation for, like, electrical utility uh, undergrounding, those places, once the power came back, and those were back up in the matter of uh, days or weeks, which wasn't seen in other parts of the territory. And even going farther uh, to what we saw in Puerto Rico with power out, what, in some places over a year or more. Yes. Governor Mapp had a fairly progressive uh, timeline for restoring power, and he was able to meet it. His, his hope was to have, by Christmas 2017, 90% of power restored uh, to eligible customers within the territory, and I believe that was met, and 100% was met fairly soon after that. So the territory had power within a matter of months, um, which we know Puerto Rico took a matter of almost almost a year. To, to give our listeners an idea of how long that was, when did the hurricanes actually hit? Um, Hurricane Irma hit St. Tom- did a direct hit on St. Thomas and St. John on September 4th, and then St. Croix was hit by Hurricane Maria on September 16th. So about in three and a half months, they had power. Yes. Now the big question, what went according to plans and what didn't go according to plans? So... Like I mentioned earlier, FEMA was following the plans they developed pretty closely with the territory, and then Maria came 12 days later, and it kind of threw all the plans out of whack. Uh, So we were following the plan pretty closely, um, but probably one of the biggest problems with the plan is it relied heavily on if the U.S. Virgin Islands got hit, getting support from Puerto Rico. And if Puerto Rico got hit, getting support from the U.S. Virgin Islands. And so the plan did not account for both getting hit by Cat 5 hurricanes in a two-week period. And a lot of this information and the, the what went right and what went wrong can actually be found in the FEMA released an after-action review for the, the Caribbean and what happened. So none of this is a secret, but I think... And the hazard mitigation plan, uh, you know, part of its development is actually to to be eligible for hazard mitigation grant funding. And a lot of the things that the territory realized were risks that they faced were things that happened in Irma and Maria, like uh, some minor flooding in areas, a lot of the wind damage that occurred. And so not only did they have a good success of PDMs, but they had a long list of projects they've been wanting to do for a long time, which are now a large majority of them will be able to be funded. So the hazard mitigation plan kind of went according to what actually happened in Irma and Maria. When uh, the hurricanes hit both the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, what was the next fallback area for hospitals, uh, 
to move people to before they could uh, be moved to the mainland? When Irma hit, a lot of people were evacuated to Puerto Rico. And then when Maria hit and that Puerto Rico was no longer an option, a lot of people were then evacuated to Miami uh, or Atlanta, Georgia. So the other uh, Caribbean islands weren't of much use to them, at least as far as evacuation? A lot of the other uh, surrounding Caribbean islands were also hit by these storm events. So they they weren't an option anyways. But And I'm not sure about this, but I don't think the way f- the federal government responds allows us to evacuate to a, a neighboring country. Yeah, from my perspective, I do know uh, many patients were evacuated directly to Florida and Atlanta. How long of a trip is that from uh, the Virgin Islands or Puerto Rico to, say, Miami? The trip from St. Croix to Miami is approximately two and a half hours. Uh, Now, what one thing are you really proud of from the recovery period? So I'm proud and excited about the update to the Territory's Hazard Mitigation Plan, which is going to be completed by the University of the Virgin Islands. And the plan will have four overarching concepts that will be incorporated throughout the entire plan, which is resilience, sustainability, climate adaptation, and cultural awareness. And I know the cultural awareness is, is something new, probably we've never seen in much of any planning mechanism, but the island's culture is so important to who the people of the territory are, and especially for bringing in tourism, that we want to make sure that the plan is culturally relevant. So the plan is going to be a sector-based plan. So there's 13 sectors identified, and they include standard sectors that you see in a lot of plans like housing, critical infrastructure, natural resources. However, it's going to include a lot of things that probably have never seen in a hazard mitigation plan before, like there's an agricultural sector and the economic development, and there's going to be an arts and culture sector. And each sector will have its own working group who will determine the risks from hazards to their sectors and will develop mitigation strategies specific to their sector and needs. And finally, the plan is going to be entirely online and interactive. It will not be paper-based at all. It won't be the first online plan because New York State just got approval for their plan and it is the first online plan, but it will probably be one of the second or maybe the third. So I think um, this was my first response to a disaster, but um, I think one one unique aspect was this focus on built environment and really the close collaboration between the Department of Health and Human Services, FEMA, and um, our local decision makers in the Virgin Islands to really focus on uh, the long-term health of residents when we're thinking about rebuilding. And from my perspective, it's, it's been rewarding to see some of the, these healthy community design principles um, included in some of the, the different plans and reports that have been developed so far during the recovery planning process. So um, as an example, the governor's task force report um, it laid out his initiatives for the long-term recovery. And some initiatives included to implement safe routes to schools, Um, to deploy recommendations for improving walkability, and also kind of a specific recommendation that that was developed was to rebuild using um, roundabouts at intersections instead of traffic lights wherever possible. So roundabouts have the added benefit of reducing vehicle speed so intersections are safer for pedestrians, but post-disaster they don't rely on on electricity, so they still function right after a disaster. So I think just seeing examples like that where um, the the topics that Jack was working on and also from a health promotion perspective to see those initiatives incorporated into the plans has been um, rewarding for me. Um, We've also seen the the coalition or the work group that that, um, I put together while I was there is developing a Um, complete streets policy together with AARP. And I think by doing things like this um, that will will strengthen the infrastructure to include things like trails and sidewalks and parks and better public transportation for the people of the Virgin Islands, um, hopefully they'll have the opportunity to rebuild stronger and healthier.
Um, also, it's been, it's been really nice to see some progress made on one of the projects that Jack and I worked on with our local partners, which focused on that area around the hospital. Um, our partners in the Department of Health and Public Works have been collaborating to create a plan that will reduce flooding risk and then also um, provide those opportunities for active lifestyles for the nearby residents. Um, and so as we see that plan and that project kind of develop further, um, I, it's, it's been really, really exciting to see that progress. Were you able to access USDOT funds for this also? So I, I believe um, part of this project will involve DOT, or at least um, there was some discussion of that when I was there, um, because some of it was eligible. It was already a plan that was on um, their, their DOT plan before, um, and so I believe they will be able to contribute to part of it, especially the, the transit stops that were being added in that area. Every little pot of money helps. Yes, exactly. The project will actually uh, be largely reliant on not only the hazard mitigation grant funds, but also uh, HUD and the CDBGDR. Um, they're going to be, because they can be used together, one of the few sources of federal fundings that can be matched to one another. So there'll be a, a quite a combination of those two helping the entire project. After disasters, uh, my experience is communities think of, you know, the one pot of money when there's a lot of other money available to accomplish what they want to accomplish in the recovery process. So having... Absolutely. And that was part of my job as the mitigation advisor. I spent a lot of time trying to understand not only my own pots of money, but other federal agencies' pots of money. And we worked across a lot of federal agencies to make sure that if one agency wasn't picking it up, another agency could, and matching sources of money where we could, and even dividing up projects in ways that we could you know, fully leverage all sources of federal funding. Sounds like you did a wonderful job on that. Earlier, Jack, you had mentioned uh, assistance from APA. Uh, what types of outside planning assistance did you receive, and what kind of assistance do you think uh, needs to be out there in the future? So our partners uh, in the USVI received, uh, including the Department of Public Works and Department of Housing and the hospitals, they received a community planning assistance team support from APA to help conduct um, what we're hoping will be a community charrette or design and or design around the hospital road project. Um, and this has been a valuable resource as the planning capacity is really limited in the USVI and many of their proposed projects would not have been possible without the assistance. But APA was able to expedite the review process and put together a team of uh, planners uh, with expertise in green infrastructure, or walkable design, and public health. And the CPAD is currently working with our partners to help them create the design that meets the community's needs and contributes to the long-term resilience of that area and St. Thomas as a whole. So the CPAD actually completed their initial site visit in September and is working on putting that larger team together. And hopefully they're going to be coming back to St. Thomas in January or February. Um, and the stakeholders and everyone involved in this project, from the governor down, has been very excited about the CPAT and what it, what it hopes to bring to the territory. As far as what planning assistance could use in the future, the USVI could use a lot of planning assistance across the board. Um, as we discussed earlier, they don't have a strong, at least traditional land use planning background, and there are actually a few handful of professionally trained planners in the territory, but by and large, none of them are actually doing land use planning. So they could use a lot of planning efforts, and FEMA and other federal agencies and even nonprofits have been providing assistance where available, but they, they need a lot of assistance. Are you going to encourage them, you know, post-disaster, obviously, to request CPATs for other planning uh, ideas in the future? Yes, uh, they, they were encouraged. Uh, the territory made several applications to the American Planning Association, and under their 
disaster relief funding that they made available, the planning assistance grants that they made available uh, post the 2017 disaster season. Um, however, I believe the other two applications they submitted, one for St. John and St. Croix, were not accepted by APA. Um, so they do have this one for St. Thomas, but I, I hope that they will continue to keep applying for CPAT and other forms of assistance when it comes to planning. I led a CPAT team uh, two years after a disaster occurred to help a community in Tennessee. So APA is available to have teams, not just right after the disaster, but at other times in the future. So hopefully they will uh, get a CPAT team from APA. Yes, absolutely. And I should say that uh, FEMA's Community Planning and Capacity Building Group, uh, who deploys post-disaster ha- did help, I believe they're all completed now, did help each island, St. John, St. Thomas, and St. Croix, working with uh, faith-based organizations and nonprofits and a few foundations, did help each island develop their very own recovery plan that was outside of the territorial government, but working with the territorial government. So the locals in each of those islands have understood the need to do this and are pushing ahead then. Finally, what do you know now that you wish you had known before these events happened? Now's the time for your wish list. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So I did mention this was my first experience supporting a hurricane recovery. Um, So I learned so much during that one month that I was on the ground um, just about the federal recovery framework and the different agencies involved in the process. Um, And a lot of that happened while I was on the ground in the Virgin Islands, because I think that, you know, I don't think I could have learned it necessarily without experiencing it as well as I did. Um, And so I, I think for me, since I was only there for one month, I had a limited time to kind of be face to face with a lot of our partners. And so Um, I wish that I could have arrived, you know, with a better understanding of the different moving parts, Um, but I now feel like the the knowledge that I gained during that um, time in the Virgin Islands was so helpful, and I developed a lot of new professional networks with people like Jack and others from HUD um, and other, other groups, so I really, you know, I hope that I'll have the opportunity to share that expertise um, with other communities who who are either um, preparing for or recovering for a disaster in the future. Um, and especially, you know, my branch here at the CDC and the physical activity and health branch specifically are thinking about ways that, that we might be able to support communities um, in developing different strategies and plans for moving forward to promoting more activity-friendly communities in the recovery kind of context. Nothing like a a major disaster to turn you from a rookie into an old hand quickly. (laughs) Exactly. Okay, Jack, what do you wish you knew before? Um, I wish I had known a lot more about the USVI itself and uh, the way they operate, their culture, their internal workings, their politics, because they are a U.S. territory, and so they are American citizens, and they are a part of America, but... They operate a lot different than almost anywhere in the U.S. mainland of what we are traditionally used to, especially when it comes to things like how we approach land use planning. And so it was like a complete game changer going down there, and almost everything about it is run different. It looks different. It feels different. Um, That being said, that just goes to show that when you're responding to emergencies, you never know what you're going to be faced with. And if I had known a bunch of these things before I'd gone down there, I would have approached a lot of our work in a different way. I would have aimed for the same type of things we've done and we are doing, but I would have approached it in a completely different way. And then another big thing I wish I had spent more time was learning all the different things various federal agencies bring to the table in a disaster environment or even in a peacetime environment. Um, all the different funding sources and all the different technical assistance and all the different agencies within the agencies within the agencies is overwhelming, and it becomes even so more overwhelming in a disaster 
and trying to understand all those things would have been immeasurably more helpful than going in where, you know, I'd, I'd never interacted with the CDC before or the U.S. Public Health Service. I had, you know, I had vague awareness of what they did, but you find out that there's so much like one agency has to offer, and it just, I, I can't stress enough the amount of time of learning, even if you're a local government, all the opportunities that do exist post-disaster, because it's not just FEMA it's or just the Army Corps. It's so much more. Did either of you have a chance to compare notes with your colleagues that basically did the same job in Puerto Rico? So from from my perspective, um, I, since my position was pretty specifically focused on you know, the built environment. I I don't believe that I had a counterpart in Puerto Rico who was doing the same, you know, specific job or the specific focus that I was doing in the Virgin Islands. And a large part of that was because in the the Virgin Islands, they, you know, this was a, a priority before, um, and especially CDC had worked with them before to kind of think through some of these strategies and, and ways that they wanted their communities to look. Um, and, and we had not worked with, the, with Puerto Rico in the same, the same capacity before. Um, and so I don't believe that there was someone doing a similar position in Puerto Rico at the time. Well, I was lucky, and then the, the counterpart in Puerto Rico was actually my boss. So the mitigation advisor for Puerto Rico was my, was my boss back in the region, and in fact, we actually had monthly calls with all the mitigation advisors during the 2017 hurricane season. So I talked with the mitigation advisor from Florida and the mitigation advisor from Texas quite frequently. So we, we were constantly comparing notes. And quite honestly, what we discovered is we were all dealing with very vastly different things all the time. Even though we dealt with the same federal agencies, we were all dealing with hurricane impacts. Every state and territory had its own focus. And so whatever their focus was, was what was eating up most of our time and what we were mostly focused on. But all four of us were always focused on completely different things. Any opportunities for collaboration in the future between uh, Region 2 and uh, CDC? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, the just meeting Jack and getting to work with him so closely, I think, really um, strengthened the existing partnerships between both of our agencies, and specifically between um, FEMA and my branch at the CDC, uh, which is focused on community design and physical activity. So I really hope that we will have the opportunity to stay in touch. Um, as I mentioned here, uh, my group is kind of, you know, discussing ways that we can support other communities in the future. And I think just having Jack as a resource, um, you know, all of his experience working in disaster recovery and hazard mitigation would really be an important perspective on our work. Um, so I hope that I can tap him for knowledge in the future. Um, and also just wanted to point out that Jack and I and um, one of our colleagues from the Virgin Islands Department of Public Works will be presenting um, on this work that we did at APA's National Planning Conference in April. In San Francisco. One other question would be, is the Virgin Islands ready for the next one? I don't know if, they'll, if they're, they're particularly ready, but they're getting there. You know, they're, they're doing a lot of undergrounding of their electrical systems and there's been a renewed focus on preparedness and getting ready for the next storms and FEMA's had a renewed focus on the Caribbean and preparing for the next storm so they may be ready but if they're not they are working very hard to get there as soon as possible. Uh, I'll go to you Emily first. Where can we find you online and are there any resources you like our listeners to know about? Sure. So if listeners are interested in learning more about how CDC is working to promote physical activity and activity-friendly communities in the U.S., um, they can visit our website at www.cdc.gov slash physical activity. Um, and listeners can also feel free to email me at eussery, U-S-S-E-R-Y, at cdc.gov.
If anyone is interested in learning more about FEMA mitigation programs, they can always visit FEMA website and go to www.fema.gov slash what dash mitigation, a great resource for discussing all the various types of mitigation programs and fundings that are out there. In addition, I always encourage people to reach out to their local communities or, you know, more importantly, reach out to their state hazard mitigation officers uh, and find out how they can get involved in hazard mitigation in their state or local community. The, every state and territory has a appointed hazard mitigation officer. And if you want to reach me directly, you can always reach me at john.heidi at fema.dhs.gov. Thank you, both of you, for being on the podcast. This was uh, very enlightening. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you, Rich. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the American Planning Association podcast. For resources on hazard mitigation and disaster recovery, visit planning.org slash resilience. To hear past episodes of the APA podcast, visit planning.org slash podcast. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. Have an idea for a podcast series? Send it to podcast at planning.org.